Basically, if you take the first day of menstruation, if you mark that on a calendar, and you count backwards 12 days, this is generally when ovulation occurs. Every woman is very different. Some women's cycles are 28 days, some women's cycles are 40 days. So it's going to be different, but it's generally a 12-day window before menstruation occurs, regardless of how long before that. Is that clear? Okay. Um, so fertility charting is something that's extremely helpful. Basically what it is, it's a way of telling what's going on in your body. So how you have a fertility chart is you have a chart, which you can get off my website for free, um, and you need a basal thermometer. And so how you would do this is every single day, you would wake up at the same time and you would take a temperature and you'd mark it on this chart. And basically over the series of a cycle, you're going to be able to tell what's going on in your body. And when you ovulate, there'll be a big drop due to hormones in your cycle and it'll tell you ovulation and then there'll be a rise. And that second part of your cycle, you just continue to see a rise, 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 rise. Because once progesterone kicks in and once possible pregnancy kicks in, your temperature goes up. So this is a good way of telling when your most fertile times are. You can use this as um, uh, birth control after you've done a couple of cycles and you can see your signs of when it begins to happen. And this is called, some people call this natural family planning when they're using it to prevent conception. But this is very helpful also so you know when you are most fertile. Because we found a lot of people, they thought they had fertility issues, but they actually just did not know when they were fertile. They would just go by different things like, oh, I felt a little pinch here, or oh, I'm craving chocolate, or, you know, they go by, you know, some, some other things that may not show when you've ovulated. Um, another great thing that fertility charting can show you regardless of wanting to conceive is if you have a hormonal imbalance. Because the hormones have a huge effect on kind of temperature change and what's occurring in the body. So like a progesterone deficiency, a lot of times you can tell that by looking at a chart. And if your temperature after ovulation does not rise enough or continue to rise, there may be a progesterone issue. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and the last part about that is there's a phase after ovulation. And if you fertility chart, you can look at that. And if it ends up being too short, if it's less than 10 to 12 days, that's an issue with conceiving. Um, that, could also, that could mean that you're automatically having a miscarriage because it did not leave long enough time for the embryo to plant and begin to divide and flourish. So that can also be remedied with herbs. So there's some other ways to track ovulation. Uh, one really cool way is a saliva monitor, which is this little microscope that you take your saliva and you can put it on the microscope. And when there's a rise in estrogen, which happens right before ovulation, there is, your saliva starts to fern. The estrogen in your system creates ferning and crystals to occur. So you're able to look in this microscope and see, okay, I'm ferning today. Tomorrow, the next day, it might be 10 times more ferning. So then you can kind of tell when ovulation is about to occur. And then there's OPK testing, which is like a strip test that looks for a specific hormone in your system that rises right before you ovulate. That kind of is a signal of ovulation. And it's good to use, you know, if you are actively trying to conceive, it's good to use all of those because just OPK tests will drive you crazy. You're like, is that a line? Is that... Um, so it's good to kind of use all these different tools. Okay, so hormonal balance. This is one of the first areas that we explore during natural fertility, and during someone's uh, creating a protocol. Uh, hormonal balance is essential for fertility. There is an intricate orchestra that is happening every single month that makes all kinds of things happen in our body. It's what makes us menstruate, ovulate, but it also makes us um, wake up, go to sleep, our different moods are impacted by hormones. And so if any of these are out of balance, if they impact the others. And they all have to be on count. They all have to be happening when they're supposed to. So if we have one that's dominant and it's like, I'm you know, going to stay here all month long, then the whole orchestra is messed up. There's two main ones that we're going to talk about that kind of are in the forefront that pertain to fertility that I think everybody, I think people should learn this in high school, um, is estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen in the body is basically a hormone that is, that is predominantly growth oriented. It wants things to grow. It wants things to, it's like the main hormone during puberty that makes the breast grow, that makes the pubic hair grow, that makes everything start to grow. And it also is responsible for um, growing the uterine lining. It's also responsible when it's out of balance for growing and pushing cancer to begin to proliferate. <laughs> it's a hard word right now. 
Um, and so estrogen is wonderful, but too much estrogen is definitely a problem. And it's something that's happening a lot in our current societies, and we'll cover more of that in a second. Um, the other hormone is progesterone. And progesterone is specific for actually kind of preserving things. The name progesterone comes from the word progest, which means it's sustaining gestation for the embryo and for the baby. So it's the main hormone for pregnancy, which keeps the lining of the uterus from shedding so that the baby can grow and a placenta grows and it can stay nurtured instead of it you know, passing through and then they're not being a viable pregnancy. So what we're seeing a lot today, um, not always, but with a lot of women, especially in Western cultures, is we're seeing an estrogen predominance. Um, and some people call that estrogen dominance. It's a general term for it. And this is caused by a couple different things. It's caused by xenohormones, which are things in the environment that mimic hormones. Um, plastics is one of the main causes, like uh, plastic water bottles leaching into the water. Um, pesticides also are mimicking estrogen. And there is a study that showed that right when our cultures began to use pesticides and herbicides on the foods was the exact same time that the sperm count declined. A normal sperm count back in the 50s used to be 100 million. Now, if you're over 20, 20 million, you're good. That used to be considered low, but now we've had to adjust the numbers because that's what we're working with. And that was in direct relation to when pesticides and herbicides were introduced to our food chain. Um, also, the hormones in meats and dairy. Um, like I said before, estrogen is responsible for growth. So meats, they want them to grow really large. They want them to grow big and fast. They give them estrogen and their feed for that. They also want um, the female cows to you know, have bigger teeth, produce more. They're adding estrogen. One of the hormones they're adding is estrogen for this uh, reason. So what's happening is these are concentrated foods. Meat and dairy are very concentrated. And these chemicals end up concentrated in there. So when we're consuming that, we're not only you know, you, you know, eating those different foods, but we're getting these chemicals in concentrated amounts. And those animals are, you know, it's on their food every single day. Also, stress, unfortunately, causes hormonal imbalance. When we're constantly stressed out, it can cause the hormones to go out of the whack as well. And soy foods, I'm sure a lot of us here have heard you know, about soy foods. Soy foods, they thought were so great because they mimic estrogen and let's give it to menopausal women and let's concentrate it and make it into powders, make it into cheese, protein, all these different things. Um, but it's been shown, it, it definitely has a big impact not only on fertility, but on pregnancy and um, sexual development in male babies. So soy foods are definitely not a health food, especially for fertility. And then the last thing that really causes a lot of problems with estrogen is caffeine. It has been shown that someone who drinks more than four cups of coffee a day has four times as much estrogen in their system than a, than a woman who is not. So it's something else to consider. And this is, you know, it's, it's fun speaking to this group because it's like preaching to the choir. You know, so most people are like, I have to get on caffeine, no! <laughs> so. What if they drink two cups of coffee a day? Is that... I mean, they, why didn't do, it? they didn't do it on them. They just oh, did it on okay. the extreme group okay. before. But I would assume it would probably be, you know, yeah. relation. Correlated. Yeah. And they just did it on coffee caffeine. You know, they didn't do it on other forms. Okay, so one of the main issues we're also seeing besides estrogen dominance is low progesterone. And they kind of go hand in hand. Progesterone is there to keep estrogen in balance. When estrogen goes way out of balance and it's just being predominant, and this happens in men too. Men get estrogen dominance as well. And it makes their testosterone low. But in women, it makes their progesterone low. And so when this happens, this can cause miscarriage. This can cause a lot of issues such as endometriosis, PCOS, ovarian cysts. I mean, a lot of the issues that we work with are estrogen dominant issues. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how to, what to do about that, how to balance hormones naturally. Does anybody have questions about what I just said? Because I don't want you thinking about your question the whole time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so there's a couple different ways. It's kind of a multi-approach to it. But the first is diet. We all know the impact of diet. Um, but we're going to cover that in a second, but there's main two things to think about. Fiber is very, very important because fiber helps to actually bring out ex excess estrogens out of the body. We, we don't, um, that is how we excrete the excess estrogens, is through number two. <laughs> and fiber helping to take it out. 
Um, and then there's another thing, you want to make sure there's a lot of um, kale and broccoli and those types of foods in your diet because there's components in there that take out the bad estrogens. They specifically focus on the bad estrogens and take those out of the body. Um, there's some herbs that are amazing for hormonal balance. I'm going to cover just a couple of the most popular. Um, at the end, I'll ask if there's any specific kind of issues or things you want me to talk about and give herbal or, you know, suggestions on those. But basically, Vitex is the first herb we generally go to for hormonal imbalance. And the reason is, is Vitex does not contain any hormones, but it supports the endocrine system. And it's amazing at helping to increase progesterone or decrease prolactin, which ends up being an issue for, um, for some women. You wouldn't want to use this during, uh, when you're breastfeeding or pregnant for that reason. Um, but it's amazing. It supports the endocrine system, but it takes a long time to work. It takes at least three months to begin to see the results of Vitex. But this helps with women whose luteal phase, you know, that time after ovulation when we want that egg that's fertilized to be in incubation. Um, it helps to lengthen that because if it's too short, you won't have a viable pregnancy. So Vitex is amazing like that. But it's also very to it's a tonic, so it's a very safe herb to take. It's something you can take long term. Um, it also helps with a lot of menstrual issues. If, um, if you're spotting a lot, that's a sign of hormonal imbalance. If you have uh, clotty periods or too much um, dark blood, that could be estrogen dominant. So Vitex is kind of a go-to herb that a lot of people can use that won't have any bad side effects to it. The next is maca, which is a very popular herb. We've had great success um, with this superfood. We have, um, we have our clients taking every day in their fertility smoothies. We have fertility smoothies. And um, we've had such great success with this because one, maca again supports the endocrine system in both men and women. It's a fantastic herb for both. And it helps with estrogen dominance. So it helps in estrogen dominance in men and it helps with estrogen dominance in women. But it also helps with other things such as, I won't go into it, but high FSH it helps with, which is something that happens in older women who are trying to get pregnant. Um, it helps to lower that to good levels. Um, and it also can help with spotting, it can help with libido, which is a big thing when hormonal balance occurs. Um, I found that maca takes about, we have people start about 1,000 milligrams and work their way up to 3,000, depending on body size, but usually about 3,000 we try to work them up to. Um, and I also found once you're at that point and using that much maca in smoothies that it makes them really, really thick. So you know, maybe finding alternate ways of dividing that dosage, maybe taking capsules some of the day and some in your smoothie, but it'll make it into a pudding, basically, if you put all that in one. Um, and then there's a third herb called Shatavari, which is an um, Ayurvedic herb. And it does kind of the same thing. It's a very tonifying, or a very um, adaptogenic herb that helps to support the entire system. And in herbalism, you know, what I was taught and the way I like to practice is start with the most gentle things that you can. Start with diet, start with vitex, like the simpler herbs, and then move on up to other things um, so that we can get a response from the body in the gentlest way. In some cases, we do need to go to those stronger herbs. The next phase of hormonal balance is liver cleansing. The liver is one of its many main jobs, has so many jobs, but one of its main jobs is to get rid of excess hormones out of the system. And so if the liver is overloaded by a high-fat diet, if it's overloaded by um, different chemicals in the system, then it's not going to do as well of a job at getting the excess hormones out of the system. So what we do is we like to support the liver with herbs such as dandelion, yellow dock, burdock, thistle. There's a lot of different herbs you can use. All of them are great. Um, and this helps really support the liver so that it's healthy and able to function and it gives it a kind of a jump start too so it wakes it up because a lot of livers get sluggish from a diet that's too high in fat. Um, in natural, the natural fertility world, we focus on cleansing the liver, but we also focus on cleansing the uterus. Has anybody ever heard of a uterine cleanse before? Okay. This is done through herbs. It's not done manually or anything. Um, and so basically what that means is there's herbs that help the uterus to cleanse. There's herbs that help with inflammation. There's herbs that help increase circulation to the uterus. And what we have found is when, after women do, we have them do a liver cleanse and then a uterus cleanse, is that their cycles shift. Women who had um, really clotty periods disappeared. Women who had issues with blocked tubes, things, uh, issues with scar tissue, um, things helped to soften up and some of them had to go on to other things after that program but that's where we start a lot of people at is cleansing the liver and the uterus 